Hello, I'm Rasmus Bot, and uh, this is a sheep, and this is Tiny Data, Approximate Operation Computation, and the Socks of Carl Broman, a talk I presented at the Use Our Conference in Allboy 2015. And this is a, a quick and dirty introduction to Approximate Operation Computation, but uh, in secret, it's also an introduction to uh, Bayesian statistics in general. Right. So here we go. This all began on Twitter when esteemed biostatistician Carl Bruman tweeted the following. That the first 11 socks in the laundry are each distinct suggests there are a lot more socks. Carl Bruman is here putting forward a very interesting question. Interesting not only because it involves socks, but because it involves what I would like to call tiny data. So the question is this, given this tiny data set, of 11 unique socks, how many socks did Carl Bruman put in his washing machine to begin with? Now, um, big data is all the rage. And if we had big data, we might be able to solve this using some fancy machine learning algorithm. But we don't have big data. Uh, we don't even have moderate sized data. We only have 11 unique socks. And in order to solve this problem, we will need to build a problem-specific statistical model that makes the best use of the tiny information that we have. And the method that we're going to use, which is, I think deserves to be more well-known and that is really easy to implement in R, is called approximate Bayesian computation. So approximate Bayesian computation is a method for figuring out unknowns, often called parameters when you do statistical modeling, that requires one, data, and we have data, tiny data, so check on that. Two, it requires a generative model. So a generative model is any type of method or function that you can feed fixed parameter values and it will generate fake data for you. Right. We also need priors. We need to specify what information the model has before seeing the data. And finally, we need a criterion for when the simulated data from our generative model matches the actual data. That's all we need. But let's start by building a generative model of picking out socks from your washing machine. So in order to pick out socks, we need to put in socks first. So let's assume that there are n pairs of socks, let's say nine. Are these the only socks we have? No. Probably not. So let's also assume that there are a number of odd socks, let's say five. Now we're going to take these socks and we're going to put them into our washing machine. Now we are programming. We are programming in R, so we need to represent these socks somehow. And one way to represent these socks is as a vector of numbers where each sock, each type of sock, gets its own unique number. Uh, so we could represent it like this. So here we have a vector and we see there are one, two, three, four, five, up to nine pairs of socks and then there are five odd socks. And we can easily create this vector in R by just summing up how many different types of socks there are. So there are n pairs plus n odd types of socks. And then we create the vector by the following statement that we want uh, two copies of the first n pair numbers and we want just one copy of the last n odd numbers. And now it's time to wash our socks. And finally, we pull out 11 socks at random. And we can count up the socks. So here we see that we got two pairs of socks and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven unique socks. And of course, we can do this counting uh, yeah, using R. Right, now we have a generative model. Now we have a model where we can put in fixed parameter values, run the model, and it will generate fake data for us. And this is the exact opposite of what we actually want. We don't really want to generate data. We know what the data was. We know that Carl Bruman did pull out 11 unique socks from his washing machine. What we want to do is the complete opposite. We want to go from the data that we know and infer back what could be probable parameter values given this data? 
the cool thing here is that we can almost do this. We only need two more things. So first, we need priors. We need to specify what information the model has before seeing the data. And this is an opportunity to add in more information into the model beyond the data. So for example, expert knowledge. Now, we don't know exactly how many socks Carl Brumann had in his washing machine, so we can't give specific numbers. And instead, we're going to use probability and probability distributions to represent the uncertainty regarding these parameters. So let's do that. We're going to put a prior over the number of socks, and we also need a prior on the proportion of pairs among those socks. But let's start with the socks. What could be a reasonable prior? Well, I know that Carl Brumann has a family, and I guess he washes a couple of times a week, so a guess would be that there are 15 pairs of socks in his washing machine, that is 30 socks, but I don't really know. I mean, it could be as low as a couple of socks, and it could be as many as 60 or something like that socks. So I'm going to put a pretty broad prior here that is sort of centered around 30 socks, but that spans this broad range. And I'm going to use this one. This is a negative binomial distribution with a mean of 30 and a standard deviation of 15. And you can sample from this distribution using the R and binom function in R. Now we need a, a prior on the proportion of pairs. And I know some people are really orderly and have all their socks in neat pairs, but I often find that my socks are not in neat pairs. Maybe only 75% of the socks are in pairs. So I'm going to put a prior here that sort of covers this range. I'm going to use this prior here, which is a beta prior. Uh, and you can sample from this distribution using the R beta function in R. Now, if you know the number of socks and you know the proportion of pairs among those socks, you also know the number of pairs and the number of odd socks. Right, now we have our priors. This is what we're going to roll with. And, and you can surely criticize this, but this is what I came up with. Finally, we need a criterion for when simulated data from our generative model matches the actual data. And here is where you might have to think a little bit when doing approximate Bayesian computation. Uh, but we have a simple model, so we can use a simple criterion. And the criterion we want to use is that we require an exact match with the actual data. And here is where you might have to think a little bit when doing approximate Bayesian computation. But we have a simple model, so we can use a simple criterion. So we're going to consider it a match when the simulated data exactly matches the actual data. Right, now we have everything we need. Now we are ready to do the ABC. So the basic approximate Bayesian computation algorithm goes like this. You start with your priors and you draw random parameter values from these priors. This time we got 20 pairs of socks and four single socks. You take these parameter values and you feed them to your generative model and you use that to generate some fake data. And now you do this many, many, many times, maybe 100,000 times. So you generate some random parameter values, you feed it into your generative model, and you get some fake data back. And you do this again, and again, and again, 100,000 times. Now it's time to bring in the actual data, because if it's something we know, it is that Carl Brumann pulled out 11 unique socks from his washing machine. Now we're going to remove all those parameter values that didn't result in the data we actually saw. So the first uh, pair of parameter values to the left, we're going to keep those because those actually resulted in 11 unique socks. The second parameter values we're going to remove. Uh, we're going to keep the third parameter values because they resulted in 11 unique socks. We're going to remove the fourth one and so on for all the 100,000 uh, parameter values that we got. Now, all of this is very easy to do in R. So here is a data frame uh, uh, where we have uh, random parameter values from the priors. And in the last two columns, we have generated data using the parameter values from the same row. And now we simply subset this data frame and only keep those parameter values that resulted in 11 unique socks. And here is the resulting data frame that we get posterior to after having used the data. Now, the distribution of the remaining parameter values represents the probability that there were a certain number of socks 
in Carl Brumann's washing machine. That is, a parameter value that is more likely to result in the data we actually saw is going to be proportionally more common in this data frame. So let's look at this distribution. We started out with this. This was the prior that we defined ourselves. And this was the posterior distribution we got after having used the data. Now we can see here that this distribution is still pretty broad, which means it's, it's still quite uncertain how many socks there actually were in Carl Roman's washing machine because it spans a range from around 20 to 80. But we can still use it to make a best guess. So one way of making a best guess is to take the midpoint of this distribution, the median, like this. So using the median as our best guess, our best guess is 44. Well, now you can wonder how good is this guess? Well, lucky us, Carl Brumann later tweeted how many socks there actually were in his washing machine. He tweeted, there were 21 pairs and three singletons. So there were 21 times 2 plus 3 in total, 45 socks in his washing machine. We were off by only one sock. I think that's pretty good. Right, so what have we done? We have specified prior information using probability and probability distributions. We have specified a generative model and we got out the probability of different parameter values using approximate Bayesian computation. The example we used was about socks in Carl Brumann's washing machine. But the cool thing with approximate Bayesian computation is that it works on any generative model, uh, any type of input parameters, any model that you can define, and any type of output data, one dimensional or multi dimensional. This is the cool thing with approximate Bayesian computation. So, in conclusion, uh, approximate Bayesian computation is information efficient. It allows you to craft a highly problem-specific statistical model that can use information both from data and from, say, export opinion. It's principled. Uh, we haven't really touched on this, but approximation computation has a solid foundation in probability theory. It's very easy to code up in R. So this code here is the whole SOC analysis, everything. It sets up the priors, it defines the generative model, and it runs the approximation computation algorithm. And it's all written in base R, and this is everything. And if you need more help doing approximation computation in R, there are also a couple of packages that you can use. Now, there is a downside with approximation computation, and that is that it is so very slow. It can be the slowest way of fitting a statistical model. But if approximate Bayesian computation is too slow, you can instead do standard Bayesian computation in R. There are many good packages for doing standard Bayesian computation in R. And standard Bayesian computation is exactly like approximate Bayesian computation. The only difference is that you are a little bit limited in what generative models you can define. But on the other hand, standard Bayesian computation can be much, much, much faster. So what's wrong with my model? Well, there could of course be many things wrong with my model, but one specific thing that I think is wrong is that it does not consider big packs of tube socks. It only considers the case where you can have two of each type of sock. But if you have bought a big pack of tube socks, you might have 10 or even 20 socks that are exactly the same. And in that case, my model breaks down completely. But my point is not that I made the perfect model for figuring out the number of socks in a washing machine. My point is that approximate Bayesian computation is a really cool method. And if you use approximate Bayesian computation, there's no theoretical limitation for why you can't model big pack tube socks too. There might be practical uh, challenges like uh, time, effort, or computational power, but I would rather facing practical challenges than be stopped by theoretical limitations. Right, that was Tiny Data, Approximate Bayesian Computation and the Socks of Carl Brumann. I'm Rasmus Bot, and you can follow me on Twitter if you want to. I also have a webpage, sumsa.net, where I write about statistics, Bayesian statistics, and also about R. And you should certainly follow Carl Brumann on Twitter. He writes interesting stuff. He's an interesting guy. Even his tweets about socks are interesting. 
All right, since you are still around, I guess you have some questions. Let's do some questions. Question one Do we really need priors? Well, there are many statistical methods that do not require you to explicitly state any priors. And we could use one of those to estimate the number of socks in Carl's washing machine. Let's use maximum likelihood. So the maximum likelihood estimate is the estimate that makes the data the most likely. So let's say there are 100 socks in Carl's washing machine, then it would be pretty likely to pull out 11 unique socks because there are so many socks in his washing machine, it's pretty likely to not get any pair when you pull out 11 socks. Now, if there were a thousand socks in his washing machine, it would be even more likely to pull out 11 unique socks. And if there were a million socks in his washing machine, it would be extremely likely to pull out 11 unique socks. So the maximum likelihood estimate of the number of socks in Carl's washing machine is actually an infinite number of socks. And I would like to point out that this is a lot of socks. Yes, in this case, we do need a prior, otherwise we get a very silly answer. Question two, was the data really necessary? Well, if we look at the prior and the posterior, we see that they are pretty similar and the data didn't change the posterior from the prior that much. But this data was still important and the data still had an impact. And you can show this by changing the data. So what if Carl Brumann instead would have pulled out four pairs of socks, and three unique socks. Then the posterior would have looked like this, which is very dissimilar from the prior. So yes, the data was important, but the prior was also important. <clears throat> I don't think you are really using approximate Bayesian computation. Well, that's not really a question, but thanks for asking anyway. Yeah, I was thinking about this too. Uh, so I asked this question to uh, Christian Roberts, who is a pretty influential guy in Bayesian statistics. Can I ask, since I use an exact direction sampling algorithm in the SOX blog post, that is, I sort of use the identity function as the summary statistics, is it still okay to call it approximate Bayesian computation, which I do call it? It is still likelihood free, at least. Yes, this is exact ABC, since you wait for the data and the pseudodata to be equal. Exact approximate Bayesian computation. Thanks. Right, so uh, normally when you do approximate Bayesian computation, the criterion you use is that uh, you accept parameter values that uh, result in data that is sort of approximately like the data you actually have. And that's why it's called approximate Bayesian computation. But in my case, I used a, a criterion that required an exact match. So that's why you can call it maybe exact approximate Bayesian computation. So last question, what about publication bias? Uh, <laughs> what about publication bias? Well, uh, Thomas Lumley wrote the following in a blog post. Rasmus Bolt wrote a post using approximate Bayesian computation to estimate a posterior distribution for Carl's socks. What he didn't consider was the impact of publication bias. In order for us to see the tweet, it was not only necessary that Carl's first 11 socks were distinct, it was also necessary that he found this remarkable and, probably, that no one he follows on Twitter had made a similarly laundry-related observation at any recent time. Now we've seen his socks, other laundry data will face a higher barrier to publication. Well, I can't agree more with Thomas here. My, my sock model does not consider publication bias at all. And it would actually be pretty cool if somebody would fix it and make it consider a publication bias too. So that was all I had. And if you have more questions, feel free to tweet me or mail me. Thank you.